uh, series where we also talk about the um, process of infographics and the various aspects of it. Uh, so given the fact that VisMe is both a presentation and infographic tool, it makes perfect sense that we form some of our webinars around these two types of content. Now, whether it's a presentation or an infographic, you are dealing with uh, various uh, visual forms of content. So some of the tips can be related from one medium to another. On another hand, each of these types of content has a specific purpose, be it in a communication, sales, or information funnel. So it's very helpful for one to determine which form to create and how to create them more effectively for your audience. And before I introduce you uh, to our presenter today, just a few, couple, a few notes about me and VisMe. I'm a designer by heart, and uh, I love communicating visually. I've been doing it for over 15 years. But the problem most people that I see face, and we're talking about over 95% of everybody else that are not designers, or they don't have the experience with complex design tools, nor the time to learn them, um, you know, there really isn't a great tool out there to be able to create content much more effectively. So that's the primary reason why I found a VisMe a few years ago, and to give everyone else the ability to create great content faster and more effectively over traditional tools. Now, VisMe is continually evolving and is creating its own ecosystem. As we continue to improve VisMe, we also have taken a deeper approach to educating our users. Earlier this year, we decided it was time to relaunch our blog as a visual learning center. If you haven't visited our blog lately, I highly recommend you do so because it contains a lot of great content to help you become a better presenter, communicator, and storyteller. Also, additionally, at the end of this webinar, we're going to provide a coupon code for VisMe exclusive to this webinar. So if you're not a premium member of VisMe yet, you could definitely take advantage of the code. Now, onto the fun stuff. Now, onto our webinar, we'll keep this pretty straightforward. I'll first introduce the presenter, and after 30 to 40 minute presentation, we'll have a Q&A session that will last about 15 minutes. You should also, uh, you also have a Q&A icon, so as questions arise, you can ask them, and of course, we'll answer them during, and most of it after the session. We will also be recording this webinar, so we'll send a link in the next week or so, and we would love for you to share others if you like what you see. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Randy Crum. He is the founder of Infinude and author of the book, Cool Infographics, which I highly recommend that you read to further understand the intrinsics of infographics. He does a pretty good job of explaining things in layman terms and with a lot of visuals, so it's a great read for everyone. Uh, Randy will be covering today's topic, why the readers love infographics, the science of data visualization, and infographics. Welcome, Randy. Thanks, Payman. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you fine. Excellent. Um, so thank you, Payman, um, and thanks to VisMe for setting up the webinar. Um, of course, also thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, this is a really fun topic that a lot of people like talking about, um, especially me. I do this all the time, so uh, I love talking about infographics and data visualization. As Payman mentioned, um, I run the website coolinfographics.com, um, where I try to highlight some of the best designs I can find um, from designers all over the world. I've been running it since 2007. Um, and so we have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of great infographics on the site uh, that are really meant for inspiration for anybody who wants to do data visualization. Uh, my book is Cool Infographics. Um, I'll only mention that here and then maybe a little more at the end, but it goes through everything we're going to talk about today, um, plus a whole bunch of resources, tips um, for design, as well as how companies are using infographics in a whole bunch of different ways. And then InfoNute is my design company, um, where we design data visualizations and infographics for clients all over the world. Um, really only about half or maybe less than half of the design work we do are the public infographics that everybody sees online and social media, on blogs, um, in content marketing campaigns, that kind of thing. Um, but companies have really grabbed onto this data visualization idea. Um, and the other half of our work is helping companies use their confidential proprietary information and then visualize it internally um, to help them make better business decisions, whether it's uh, board meetings or sales presentations or even employee training. Um, so that's what we do. You can find me most of the time on Twitter um, at RT Chrome. Um, and if you want to tweet, you know, as we go throughout today, um, if you use the hashtag data viz, I also recommend, you know, follow the hashtag data viz online because a lot of designers um, across the world use data viz uh, as a popular hashtag when they're talking about visualizing data. So let's dive right in. Um, I want to start with information overload um, and this problem that all of us face as consumers of information. 
Um, the, the research recently um, in 2014, it was updated, uh, reveals that an average American is exposed to what they call the information equivalent of 280 newspapers per day. Um, that's up from only 40 newspapers per day back in 1986. And what that means is that all of the information that you have to absorb, whether it's stuff being thrown at you like advertisements and business information um, and television and stuff like that, um, as well as all the information that you're actually going out there and looking for, um, like doing research online or watching TV or reading a book or a magazine. If you equivalent, or sorry, if you compile all that and put it together as if it was all newspapers, we have to sort through 280 newspapers per day and figure out, you know, what of that information is important. What do I want to actually act on and do something with it? And how much of that I just can ignore and it's, you know, it was good to know or I didn't even need to know that and move on. So when we talk about data, um, let's do, do a little grounding in how we measure data. So this yellow square represents the size of a gigabyte. And to give you a frame of reference, um, movies on uh, DVDs are either only like one or two gigabytes in size. Um, so a movie is about a gigabyte in size. But if I shrink this yellow square down to the bottom left corner, um, now this red square represents the size of a terabyte. A terabyte is 1,024 times larger than a gigabyte. Um, and so modern computers and laptops will come with a uh, half a terabyte or a one terabyte or even a two terabyte drive. Um, and so that's basically the, the today's modern storage size is a terabyte when you get a computer. And I'll go one more step, and that's to a petabyte. So when you see this square, um, the bottom left corner is a single yellow pixel, and that's that gigabyte. That single pixel is the size of a movie. Um, a terabyte is that small red square. Um, so that's a thousand movies. Um, and so this size of a purple square, this petabyte is how we measure data warehouses. Um, and this, you know, this again is a thousand times larger than the terabyte and is equivalent to about 1 million movies or 1 million DVDs um, and in size. And that's what we're talking about. So when we look at, you know, the size of data today, um, Google revealed a few years ago that they were processing 20 petabytes a day, and that was back in 2008. Um, they haven't revealed that kind of information since then, and obviously it's been growing. Um, there's a really good estimate that says that the entire written works of mankind in every language since the beginning of recorded history adds up to a grand total of about 50 petabytes of information. Um, so that's everything we've ever written down as a species. Um, but last year, Facebook revealed uh, that their data storage, their data warehouse, was up to 300 petabytes and was very quickly growing. So 300 petabytes is six times the amount, you know, the entire written works of mankind. Why does Facebook need all this space? Um, and that's really because of file sizes. Um, so we're all watching videos and images and audio files on Facebook and the other social media platforms. And those take an immense amount of data storage space. Um, we even had an estimate that uh, this new NSA data center in Utah, uh, that the estimates from the outside, because the NSA is not actually revealing this, um, was that, that this data storage at this facility was going to start at about 2,000 petabytes. Right? And if you go back to the movie is a gigabyte, you know, 2,000 petabytes is 2 billion movies. And that's the size the facility is going to start with and probably grow from there. So that's data storage. We also talk about how much data we're just, you know, passing back and forth and looking at every day. This is the Cisco Visual Networking Index that measures how much data is actually moving across the internet. Um, and this year in 2015, we're moving about 76,000 petabytes per month um, of data that's moving across the internet. And somewhere between 2016 and 2017, we're gonna cross over that 100,000 petabytes a month of data that we're transferring. What that means to us as consumers of information and consumers of all this data um, is that it's really hard for us to find what it is that actual, that nugget, that piece of information we're actually looking for. Um, and not only that, it gets harder every day because we keep adding more and more data um, to the internet. We are drowning in data. Um, I like to say that we will never have less data than we do today, right? It's not like next year we're gonna say, whoo, Life is so much easier because we have less data to work with. Um, no, we're going to have more data next year, and it's going to keep growing, and it's only going to go in the upward direction. Um, and 
we as designers of data visualizations, right? So as we design data visualizations and infographics, it's our job to try and make that data more digestible, more understandable, more consumable by our audience. Um, now we've been doing this for a really long time, thousands and thousands of years, um, starting with you know cave drawings and the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And um, even today, we use very simple images like this road sign um, that we, as humans, we can understand very quickly. Um, so we've been doing visuals for thousands of years, you know, much longer than we've been doing the written word. What the advantage that we want to take advantage of as a designer is that a huge portion of your brain is dedicated to just processing visual information. I've seen studies somewhere between 60%, this one says 80%, I've even seen 90%. Um, but it's your sight, obviously, but it's also your spatial sense, your visual memory, um, and specifically even your pattern recognition. Um, humans are the you know, best pattern recognition machines on the planet. Um, you can see this image of a lion hiding in the grass, and within less than a second, a fraction of a second, you not only can recognize that those are two different shapes, the lion and the grass, and that there's one hiding in the other, um, but you know what it is. You can recognize that it's a lion, and what its meaning is, what its context is, because you realize that your life is now in danger if you see this right in front of you. Um, and you can do all this within a fraction of a second, and you're really good at not only seeing and recognizing a pattern, but understanding its meaning. Um, we're still better at that than computers are. Um, I don't know what the future holds, but at the moment, we are still the best pattern recognition machines on the planet. Um, planet 4 is a, a website that uh, hosts these high-resolution images of the surface of Mars, and they're looking for these black sort of scars on the surface that show where gas has escaped up from the surface. And they, they really were unable to get computers to reliably find these black scars on the surface. Um, they set up this website so that you know people, you and me, can log in, create an account, um, and they're asking people to look at these photos and help them identify where these um, black marks are, where it's a black mark and not just a shadow, um, to help them understand how the surface of Mars works. So that's, you know, we're so good at pattern recognition. The other thing that we want to take advantage of from a visual sense is called the picture superiority effect. And what the picture superiority effect tells us is that if I tell you something, if you do nothing but listen to me, or if you just read text, that three days later, you are likely to only remember 10% of that information. Um, it's really a different part of your brain. But if I can somehow tie that information, that data, that concept to an image, to a picture, to a chart, to a visual of some sort, um, you're really going to tie into that pattern recognition and that visual memory. Um, and three days later, you are likely to remember up to 65% of that information. Um, so as marketers, right, we not only want to communicate our information really well, but we want our audience to then remember that information and be able to act on that information at a later time. Um, and so we want to take advantage of this. And advertising has been taking advantage of this for many, many years, years and years and years, where, you know, you will see an advertisement that has a big, memorable, iconic image that's tied to a really short message. It might be the brand name. It might be, a, you know, a tagline or a motto or a little product description. Um, but the idea is that you're going to remember the image and tie that to the concept. In fact, that's a really big reason why companies have logos to begin with. Um, you are more likely to purchase a product from a company that you're familiar with, and you're more likely to remember the company's image, their logo, than you are the name of the company. And so companies use these logos to help trigger that you're familiar with this company and actually help you uh, or make you be more comfortable buying products from that company. Um, so when a, a company calls up or a client calls up and says, hey, we want to work on an infographic project, the word infographic really means many, many different things to different people. And so we have to go through this process of when you say you want an infographic, um, what is it we're talking about? What do you have in mind? So I need to make this distinction, and I do this in the book as well, um, between what's a data visualization and an infographic, because we're surrounded by visual information, whether it's you know on road signs or buildings or you know newspapers as well as online. But I don't call all of those infographics. Um, so I try to make this distinction. So this is a data visualization. This is what I call a chart. 
Um, there are more than 80,000 data points represented here in this line chart of the different stock market ind indexes, um, indices. And so, you know, this is a visual representation of the data. It's a chart, but it's just that. It's visual, but then it's up to you, the audience, to look at this and figure out what's important. Is there anything here you can learn from this data? Um, it's totally up to you. It's just, here you go. Here's a visual representation of the data. There's another level that I call info art. Um, and so this is a graphic that's created based on data, but it's not actually functional or useful to the audience. It's just really, you know, cool and interesting and fun to look at. Um, this one in particular, uh, they sell it as a poster. It's a design of the first 1,000 digits of the mathematical constant pi. Um, and so the 10 digits are represented in little segments around the circumference of the circle, zero through nine. Um, and this is one continuous line that starts at three, 3.14159, and goes continuously through the first 1,000 digits of pi. Um, now, it's really cool to look at, but it's not a reference you would use to say, okay, well, how many times did the number two show up? Or if you wanted to know what's the, you know, 300th digit of pi, you couldn't use this to figure that out. Um, so this is info art. And then when we talk about infographics, we really talk about telling a complete story to the audience. And that story is going to include a combination of text, icons and illustrations, data visualizations and charts, and a structured layout, all to come together and tell one complete message to the audience. Um, this one in particular, like there are 20 different data visualizations um, in this one infographic. And so when we talk about designing infographics, um, that's the distinction I make. This is one complete infographic design that uses multiple data visualizations uh, as a tool to help create that design. Um, the word infographic is actually becoming very popular online. Um, and I'll mention again, I started the Cool Infographics site back in 2007, and it was a big deal back then. Um, but even now, if you look at the Google Trends report, there's not even a blip in 2007 back then. I mean, the, the frequency of people searching when they use the word infographic as one of their search terms has increased more than 10,000% in the last four years. I mean, it's just exploding how many people are actually out there looking for infographics. Um, I do a lot of work and um, help out with teachers and schools, you know, and students are looking for infographics to find information about whatever research project they're working on before they even go to something like Wikipedia, because it's easier for them, actually more engaging for them to find information in a graphical form in an infographic than it is to try to read it um, in Wikipedia or other data sources. So knowing this, knowing that people are looking for infographics um, and looking at the stats that I have from the Cool Infographics site, um, I've developed what I call the five second rule. And what I've learned is that, you know, far and away, the big majority of people that are looking at infographics, you know, millions and millions of views on the website, they're only looking at an infographic for somewhere between five and 10 seconds. And so what that means to us is that, um, as designers, we have to be able to communicate a message, whatever it is we're trying to communicate to the audience, within that first five seconds that someone's looking at an infographic. So I call that the five second rule. And so you've got the, the majority of your audience that's gonna be that top layer of design. They're gonna look at it for you know, a handful of seconds and get the main idea, and then they're gonna go on about their life. And then you have a smaller portion of your audience that's gonna spend a lot longer and actually dig into the details, but that's a much, much smaller part of the audience looking at your infographic. And so we want to define what is the key message before we actually start the design work. You know, we need to know what is that one thing that the customer wants to communicate in those first five seconds so that we can drive the design to communicate that message. Um, so in this case, this one is where Google's making its money. Um, it starts off, you know, Google makes 97% of their revenue from advertising and then has this big colorful pie chart of the top 20 most expensive keywords um, in Google AdWords in their uh, advertising platform. And so as long as the audience gets, okay, Google's making their money from advertising and then maybe they go on about some of their day and move on to cat videos or whatever else, um, you know, mission success because they walked away with that key message and they didn't really need to dig in and understand that, you know, number six keyword is lawyer and number 18 is rehab. Um, you know, th there's a small part of the audience that's going to want to dig in and actually dive into what are the most expensive keywords. But that's not the main point. The main point is to communicate that Google's making their money from advertising. Most infographics, you know, um, really good ones that I like and do a good job of communicating their messages follow what I call the three-part story format. Um, so, you know, they start with some sort of introduction. 
you know, what is it this infographic's about? Why is it interesting to the audience? And is there any basic background information that your audience needs to understand um, before you need to, you know, walk into the main key message? And then, of course, you want that visual centerpiece. You want the main attraction of the infographic design to be that key message, what I call the main event or that aha moment that you're sharing with the audience. Um, and then you want to, and a lot of uh, infographics actually forget to do this, is you want to end with some sort of conclusion or call to action. You know, something, what is it you want your audience to do now that you've revealed this new insight or this new information that uh, they didn't know before? So here's a quick example. This is called the Tower of Beer, right? And so then in the introduction, um, Tom starts investing a dollar a day at the age of 25, and that by the age of 70, when he can retire, his retirement income is this massive amount of money where if he wanted to, he could spend it all on beer, and it would be this massive tower of stacks of cases of beer that we visually in the centerpiece compare to really small and tiny, the Statue of Liberty on the left, and the tallest tower in the world currently in Dubai, and, you know, and Tom up on top of his massive tower of beer, and so that's the visual centerpiece and then the bottom and it doesn't have to be a hard sell but the you know the call to action here just says learn more at rothira.com so now that you know if i've grabbed your attention and you're interested in learning about retirement and saving money for retirement um you can go learn more here and that call to action you know can be anything it can be vote a certain way it can be um buy a certain product or eat healthier or go out and exercise more often or even call your mother you know that call to action or that conclusion can be anything you want their audience to do with that information and so when it comes down to it you know good infographics really you're trying to do three things these are our three goals when we do infographic design you know we want to take message or information or data and present it to the audience in a way that's understandable that's memorable and that's actionable something that they can go out and do something now that they've learned something new online or even in print I mean, it's not specifically online but a lot of these are um, we've really seen a growth in multiple different formats in the way people are sharing um, infographics online so static at the very basic is the most popular way to share infographics that's usually um, a jpeg image or something shared online and then we've actually started increasing levels of complexity and interaction um, throughout the design so this is what a static infographic looks like. This one is the how many cooks, how many guide to kitchen conversions and maps out, you know, how many teaspoons in a tablespoon, how many tablespoons in a cup, how many cups in a gallon. Um, and it's just a static image. Um, and it's really easy for people to share static images online, whether it's on their website or on Facebook or on Twitter. Um, and it's really popular because it's really easy to share. And we find in general that most of the ones that are static and shared online are what I call the tall format. Um, these tall, you know, long infographics, um, because in web browsers, it's really easy for the user to scroll up and down. Um, and most web browsers are really good that if the content is tall like this and is longer than the screen size, it knows to add a scroll bar and let you scroll down and see more information. Um, it's not as good as if you make wide horizontal designs. If you do those, sometimes it'll give you a scroll bar. Sometimes it'll actually shrink the design so small that you can't read anything. Um, the other thing is that these tall formats work really well if it's online is the only place that you're going to see this infographic. If you want to, say, for example, put it on a presentation slide like this, um, I have to shrink it down so small that you, you, know, you can't read all the information. Or if your audience is going to want to print those out on pieces of paper, um, again, it's going to have to shrink down. So these work really well if the target is online distribution. Um, but if there are other ways of distribution, you want to try and make it more to a format that's printable or viewable online or in a presentation. Um, moving up in the levels of difficulty is a zooming interface. If the if the static design is so complex, like this is a poster of the history of pop and rock music over the last hundred years, um, it's really complex and you can't you know even read that much information because it's sold as a printed poster. Um, you get this zooming interface online where you can zoom in and engage with the data and move around and see different parts of the data. So it's still a static design, but there's some um, interactive tools available to the user online. There's another one called pop-up information where the visual design is nice and clean and simple, like this election map from the New York Times around uh, the state of North Carolina. Um, and each you know, voting district is color-coded based on the results of the election that year. Um, but all the data, all the numbers are hidden until you hover over any of the voting or uh, 
yeah, voting districts. So here you see up in the top of the state, um, I've hovered over one particular voting district and it pops up the actual voting details behind that district. And so your audience that wants to see that detail can, but all that data and information doesn't um, cloud or, or really uh, make the original visual design very complex at all. You take all that data out. Um, clickable is another one where you actually almost turn an infographic into a navigation tool where you know each of these icons, this is an analysis of iPhone apps that are related to the wine industry. Um, each one of those is clickable and it will take you to that app and the app description on the Apple iTunes store. Um, this one in the style of a subway map um, is all the websites and uh, that were related to creativity and design and data visualization and infographics and things like that. Um, and it's in the style of a subway map, but each node is actually a website and it's clickable. So if you click on any of these stops on the subway, it will actually take you to that website. Um, and we're starting to see a lot more animation. Um, this is a website um, called Wind Maps um, that animates the most current uh, wind data from the National Weather Service. Um, this is actually a, a historical look at uh, her, what it looked like during Hurricane Isaac in 2012. But if you go to the website, it actually shows you, you know, the most current uh, wind data and animates it so you can see the, the directional information a lot more clearly than if it was just a bunch of arrows on the map. And designers are learning this. We're starting to see a lot more uh, animated GIF files that are shared as infographics. So this big, tall infographic is now an animated GIF file instead of a JPEG. And that allows designers to add some motion. Um, and the idea is that that motion should help the audience, your readers, um, actually understand the, the data better. So the idea of these uh, flight patterns and the way birds and insects' wings move during flight, you know, you could tell somebody that it's this kind of curve and this arc and the mathematics that go along with it, but it's a whole lot easier for the audience to understand if they can see it. Um, Take that one step farther, there are a lot of people now that are releasing YouTube videos um, that, or not just specifically YouTube, but videos that are um, built on data visualizations and actually are an infographic video. Um, so you see stuff like in the top left where it's a visualization of target stores opening over time across the US, um, or what we call a motion graphic in the top right where it's icons and text and data visualization moving on and off the screen to tell a story. Um, and even live action. So the one on the bottom left is an NPR video uh, about population growth across the planet. Um, and even like TED Talks in the bottom right, Hans Rosling has this animated data visualization running behind him um, while he's talking through his talk. At the very top of our complexity curve, we really see interactive designs where it allows the audience, the readers to engage and interact with the data. Um, this is a pretty simple example called the Tweet Topic Explorer, where you can put in anybody's Twitter ID. It'll create this bubble map of word frequencies of all the tweets that that person or that Twitter account um, posts. And you can dive in, like here I've clicked on mine and the word design, and it will actually bring up all the tweets that had the word design in them. Um, and you can sort of dig into the data, and you can, then you can put somebody else's user ID in. Um, and then some of these, like this is Gapminder. Um, this is some software that was being used in the background for that TED Talk where you, there are 200 different data sets and you can change what's being shown on the x-axis and y-axis and then hit play and it actually animates the data over time. When we do data visualization, um, there are really two goals um, and we focus our infographic design really on the communication side. So the discovery side is usually that data scientist, that researcher, or that marketer is looking at their data and trying to find that insight, that trend, that outlier, you know, that what is that nugget of information they can learn from the data. And then that they need to turn around and be able to communicate, you know, here's what we did as far as research and here's what we've learned. Um, and usually the, the designs for communication are where we focus on because you're trying to communicate your insight and your data to a public audience or to executives or to customers, you know, or to somebody who's not going to want to dig into the full detail. They just want to understand what did you find in the data and what does it mean? And like I said at the beginning, a lot of companies, they have their external communication of data and infographics for content marketing and online and for sales information. Um, but a lot of companies are now using, you know, data visualization and trying to be better at not only learning from their internal proprietary data, but also communicating it better internal to the company. So when we design data visualizations, um, we really want to tap into what are called pre-attentive attributes. Right. And so pre-attentive attributes are visual aspects that you as an individual, as a consumer of information, you can process that information in a fraction of a second because that part of your brain 
is the first thing that sees that information and doesn't need to pass it up to your higher brain functions to understand like reading does. So if we change the form or shape of something, the color of something, um, its size or position on the page or on the screen, you know, your eye sees that immediately. That's part of your pattern recognition ability. And we want to take advantage of that um, when we do designs for data visualization. So we're going to do a quick little exercise. Um, payment, if you would bring up the, the poll as part of the Zoom interface. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to count the number of fours that you see in the next slide where there's gonna be a grid of numbers. And I want you to go ahead and count the number of fours and then enter it um, in the quick poll through the Zoom interface. And I'll wait just a second because you know, I want you to, to dig through, find the fours and, and answer the poll. And payment, let me know what you see. All right, so we're seeing currently uh, at the moment, well, let's give a few more seconds. There's a lot of answers coming in. We've got 11% uh, saying six, 25% saying seven, 55% saying eight, and 8% 8 saying nine. All right, excellent. Okay, so we'll keep going. Um, so this is the hard way to see things. So if you see nothing but data in text, this is what you're seeing. It's actually harder for you to go through and and in your brain, keep a running count and do a visual pattern recognition to find the fours. But if I use pre-attentive attributes in the design, right, and so here I'm going to use color, right, and make those fours jump out at you. There are eight fours. Um, and I didn't count the four that was up in the title. So in the, in the block of numbers, there are eight fours. Um, but by using color and that pre-attentive attribute, you as the observer, as the reader, um, naturally gravitate to that. Right, and so that's what attracts your attention. Um, another version of color is opacity, right? And so we can make our data stand out and be the main point of focus, but then we still have to have the reference data or the data that provides context. We just make that you know, semi-transparent or darker in the background or something like that. And so that's how we can use you know, pre-attentive attributes. We can use size. Um, in this case, it doesn't work quite as well, but I make all the fours bigger. Um, or we can use very explicit callouts and circle every four. Um, and that just makes your audience, you know, make it really um, quick and easy for them to find the data that you're talking about. Um, so when you make charts in any software, any charting tool, whether it's PowerPoint or Visme or, or other online or software tools, in general, this is what a default chart looks like. So here's the population of the US uh, grouped by the age generations. Um, and by default, creates this um, legend, this color key over on the side. That's usually a default feature. And you know what we want to do as designers is we want to make this information as easy and as fast for your audience to understand. And by having that key over on the side, you make your audience look back and forth and back and forth. And it's actually fairly difficult to understand, okay, what does blue mean? Oh, what, how does that compare to purple? What does purple mean? And you go back and forth. And so you don't have to use other design tools, just using the charting tool you know, you can get rid of that legend and bring your data into the chart so it's all in one field of view to your audience. So in this case, I took all those descriptions of the generations and moved them down into the x-axis so you can see descriptions of what each bar is. Um, and I even just brought in some, some icons and put them literally just on top of the chart um, that are representative of each generation. And so we do that just to make this chart a little bit easier to understand. And then we bring in that uh, pre-attentive attribute, right? So we bring in color. So it's the same chart but I've left, let's just say my data or my conclusion as something about Gen Z. Um, and so Gen Z is colored now and I put the rest of the bars in gray. And so they're still there. You still see the total curve of the population of the US, but it's obvious to you, the audience, that what I'm talking about is this data about Gen Z, whatever that data is. Um, and that's how we use pre-attentive attributes in data visualizations. Um, and it's all about simplify, simplify, simplify and making it easier for your audience to understand what it is you're trying to communicate. So here's another example. This is a default chart of skin cancer incidence rates um, by country. Um, and so by default, it comes up with this clustered bar chart and it's really hard to read. 
Um, and so again, without using any graphic software, it's not like we're going over to the Adobe Creative Suite, just using the charting tool. Um, in this case, this is how I would convert this chart. I would take this bar chart and simplify it to make it look like this line chart, um, where from the pre-attentive attribute standpoint, I've made Australia red. It's got a much higher rate of skin cancer. Um, I've made the comparison data gray, so it's still there, but it's visually background data. It's that extra data. Um, and then cleaned up all the other visual noise, got rid of the color key legend, got rid of the chart grid. Um, in this case, I felt you didn't need all the years from 1975 to 2007 because, you know, I wasn't trying to highlight like 1983 or any particular year. It was just trying to show the overall time trend. So, you know, as designers of data visualizations, we always want to simplify that, that visual representation as much as possible. And it's really key to understand that when you're visualizing data, you're talking about multiple values. Um, it is really, really hard to communicate a data all, or a, a data point or a statistic or a number all by itself. You know, you need to provide some context in that background data or that comparison data. So as an example, if I tell you there are three billion global internet users, right, and I put it in this really big number in this bold font, um, and I make it really, you know, full size on the screen, it's still just a number by itself. And by making, you know, the numbers really big, that doesn't provide any context or help your audience understand how big or small that number is, or is it growing or shrinking? Um, and I tell designers all the time that big fonts are not data visualizations. And you will see this all the time. You'll see it in infographics, you'll see it in PowerPoint, in presentations, you'll see it in blog posts and articles. You know, people love to make the fonts really big, but then they don't visualize the number, so it doesn't help. Um, you, you generally can't chart a number all by itself either. Um, a bar chart with only one bar doesn't provide context for your audience. You know, you've got to bring in that secondary number as the context. So if I show you here that 3 billion global internet users is a portion of the over 7 billion total population of the planet, you know, then it's a big number, but, you know, we, we don't even have half the people on the planet on the internet yet. Um, so it's, it's big, but we got a long way to go. Um, if I choose a different number for context, in this case, I'll compare my 3 billion global internet users to um, the total population of the U.S., which is around 320 million. You know, that's more than nine times every man, woman, and child in the U.S. That's a lot of people on the internet. Uh, and so you really create that understanding of the data or of the key message by choosing what data points to provide as context when you're visualizing data. And then the last thing I'll mention is that, you know, text-only data um, is generally perceived as less important if it's mixed in with some other data that was visualized. And you'll see this a lot in infographics, where a couple data points will have visuals, like this one, you know, 49% of parents are using their phone's GPS to monitor their child's location, and it's got this nice icons and donut chart. Um, and then right next to it, um, you know, 64%, oh, it's misspelled here, but so parents look at the contents of their child's cell phone, and there's no visual, just the big font and the big number. Um, and what happens is your audience is drawn to the visual, and those are perceived as the most important data points. And then anything that's just text by itself is considered secondary information, and they may or may not read it. Um, so when you're deciding what to visualize, that makes a really uh, key point. So as a, as a quick wrap up, um, I'll mention the book again. Cool Infographics goes through all of these and more. Um, and if you go on to my website, coolinfographics.com to slash book, um, there you can download a PDF of the first chapter for free um, and you know, sit, check it out, you know, and try a sample. Um, it's available in ebook and print through Amazon and Barnes and Noble and everywhere else. Um, final mention of my company, InfoNude is my design company. Like I said, we design data visualization and infographics. If anybody is looking for that kind of support, whether it's online social media or internal, you know, designs for presentations or handouts or employee training, that kind of thing. Um, I want to thank again, Payman, thank you very much for setting up the webinar. Um, I know you wanted to share this discount code on VisMe, so I'll let you describe that really quickly. Absolutely. Uh, so, Randy, uh, wonderful job. You know, you always put it into perspective in, in a simple way, and I think that's what's so important about infographics, right? So, right on. Uh, so, uh, we have a discount code. It's called Data30. It's basically exclusive to this webinar. Anybody who 
is uh, looking to uh, more easily create presentations, infographics. And again, VisMe is a free tool. Everybody registers free. And if you ever feel that you want to upgrade, uh, we have a lot of great features under the premium plan. The Data 30 is actually a 30% um, off the entire period that you're going to be a subscriber of VisMe. So it's not just a one-time discount. For as long as you're a subscriber, it is 30% off. Uh, so with that said, let's uh, go on to our uh, Q&A session. So we had a few questions that came up. A couple of them I answered during this session, but um, if anybody has questions, please go ahead and start posting them. You have a Q&A link um, at the bottom or at the top of your screen, depending on your interface. Uh, there are uh, two questions uh, that came up. I'll start with the first one. In you know, order was received, uh, what size uh, should the infographics be published on Facebook and be read on a mobile device. Um, Randy, do you want to shed some light on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll share what we generally propose or recommend to clients, which is um, that that first full infographic, generally you'd want to have some sort of landing page on the company website, you know, some page that you want to direct people to so that they end up on the company page um, when they're seeing the full infographic and reading it, and then you, you've got them on your page, whether it's a backlink or a view that you're trying to track or be able to, to show them your products and services. And then for social media, uh, we would create, you know, either snapshots or snippets, you know, people call it different things, um, but basically a smaller image that is sized to custom fit for Twitter, which is a different image size than Facebook, which is different than, say, LinkedIn and Google+, where we'll probably take one key message or one data point and make a smaller infographic to share in social media, and then say, you know, to learn more, you know, follow the link to the full-size infographic on the company page. And so that's what we find on Facebook quite a bit, is that you've got that um, snippet of the infographic and a description of that, you know, that one key message or data point that the snippet includes, but it directs you to the full-size infographic on the company page. Exactly. And, and to add to that, uh, you know, getting a little bit more technical in terms of sizes, you know, you pretty much measure everything um, online in pixels, uh, you know, and of course we can argue about uh, retina display and other displays, but into yep. perspective traditionally, you know, 72 pixels per inch. So if you think about one inch is about 72 pixels. Now on Facebook versus Twitter and other uh, social uh, media networks, uh, when you post something, you know, of course, naturally, your entire infographic will not fit in there. Infographics are meant to be tall and, and uh, all the, the various reasons that uh, Randy went through. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about so much as far as getting your entire infographic at the very beginning to fit within uh, that post, because actually that's going to be impossible to read. And I, I believe that the conversion rate actually drops. So as uh, Randy mentioned, you want to concentrate on that uh, larger area focal point. And of course, the purpose is you want people to click on it to view the larger version or perhaps even um, get them to link over to, to the website that you embedded on uh, or where that infographic resides. Uh, going on to the next question, we've got a few more coming in. Um, what about accessibility and ADA compliance with color and opacity? Is there any input you have on that, Randy? Yeah, I think there, there are two questions there. So one is, you know, color um, we use from a pre-attentive attribute standpoint, you know, to highlight certain data features. But there are a number of really cool tools online that will simulate color blindness. Um, so, you know, one of the things we'll do is that we will design an image and take that as a, you know, export it into a JPEG file and then use one of these color blindness tools to look at what happens when different parts of the population look at your infographic and they still tell the difference between the bars or the, the pie chart segments or the icons that you've set up. Um, and we may tweak the colors to make, you know, make that more readable. Um, the other one is that a lot of government organizations are requiring um, accessibility. Um, and the idea of that, uh, you know, a, a text reader that's going to read the text out loud to the audience who's, you know, in some way um, disabled or has trouble with vision, um, you know, and to do that, it doesn't work with a JPEG, right? So the JPEG does, is just an image. It doesn't really include the text information. And so sometimes we'll release a PDF of the infographic so that the PDF actually includes all the text. Um, and in a lot of cases, we will actually build the text into the landing page on the company site. So it may be text that's on the page below the infographic. And so the, the accessibility readers have a way to read the text um, and the story and the key message that's in the infographic to people that are using these uh, readers. Uh, good question. Uh, and again, actually, the, speaking of uh, content ADA uh, compatibility, 
Um, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, so in, in case of Visme, the infographics that you publish are HTML5 based. Uh, well, you have an option to download as JPEG, PDF, and so on. But one of the beauties is that when you publish something on our platform, um, by default, uh, it is HTML5 based, meaning the content is almost like a web page. Uh, but of course, in terms of ADA compatibility, it's not telling a story uh, via the words. You still have to somehow describe that if it's spe specifically for that. Um, moving on to the next question, uh, do you have any suggestions for uh, choosing how to tailor the theme of your infographics for your topic or content? This is from Cody Owens. Yeah, so in a lot of cases, I mean, you really want your infographic to be you know, related to your company's product or service. I've seen, you know, a number of them that just go out there and pick a hot trending topic, even though it has nothing to do with their business, to try and get social media views and try and go viral. But what you really want are, you know, the keywords that people use to search, you know, and, and so that we're, you know, those words that bring your infographic up as part of the search results, you want those keywords to be related to your business. So that those are the same keywords um, that are going to relate to your product page or to your home page or something like that, because that's good, something that Google's going to use to say, hey, this page, this infographic page is really ranking well on these keywords. And that happens to be the same keywords that the main site's ranking for. Um, the other thought, um, and I lost my train of thought there, the other thought I think um, for keyword research is you want your infographic not only to be related to your business, but you want it to be valuable information to your audience, you know, and I, and I say that as an informative infographic. Um, and we found that infographics that are really heavy sales pitch or are very specific to a product or service, those generally don't get shared or viewed as much as some that are just good information that people like to share among each other. People don't like to share something that seems like an advertisement or um, a heavy sales pitch. They like to share good, valuable information. Great answer. Um, one more. This is from uh, Kumar. How popular are infographics for corporate dashboards? Um, so that goes back, I mean, a little bit to the distinction between data visualizations and infographics. Dashboards continue to be more and more popular, um, and people are trying to design dashboards that break out of what I call the big three charts, right? So pie charts, bar charts, and line charts are what make up most dashboard designs. Um, but a lot of tools today, whether it's um, Tableau or designing a website that's got D3 visualizations, you know, and all kinds of things. The library of ways to visualize data is growing every day. Um, and, you know, you don't want to see four bar charts about different data sets all on the same dashboard because your audience, your readers, begin to have a hard time understanding what the differences between those data sets are because they're all visualized as bars. Um, and so what we find is that you want to visualize different data sets using different visual methods. And that really helps your audience understand that this is one data set, and okay, now I've moved on to the next data set, but when this third data set is something completely different. All right, great. Uh, let's see, next question. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Miles asking, what's your workflow for building interactive infographics that also need a corresponding static version? Something like uh, Growthverse, for example. Yeah, so the part of the problem with the interactive data visualizations and infographics online is that they're really hard to share. Um, someone would have to share, you know, the embed code of the full interactive visualization or the JavaScript, and people really are not good at that. Um, what they want to do is hit that little share button and have a static image show up in Facebook or Twitter that's just sort of a representation of that interactive visualization. And so that's what we would do is we would create a static version, you know, we would carefully craft one that's not only got the static version, but maybe the brand logo or some contact information in that same image. And then when you build the sharing buttons that are on that landing page for the interactive visualization, those sharing buttons, you pre-program them to include the static image. Good question. Also to add to that as well, um, again, uh, going back in terms of Visme goes, you actually can achieve that by downloading your infographic as a static version, JPEG, PDF, um, posting that online in Facebook, in this case as an image. And then uh, one of the things we do actually ourselves is when we create infographics, uh, we will post it in uh, Facebook um, as a, a JPEG. And then we'll also say for interactive version, visit such and such. And of course the link will come to our published version on Visme because that's where you can do interactivity, animations, link clicks, pop-ups, and so on. Uh, so that's another way to get around that to answer uh, Miles' question. 
Yeah, um, and I would even add you want to you want to add that text into the image if it's at all possible. So in that image, you know, say please click or please follow this link to get to the full interactive version, because cool. people will in default in a lot of cases they'll share the image but not the text or the link that goes with it. So if you put it in the image, it goes with it all everywhere it gets shared. Absolutely. Uh, so next question: uh, What about color management, RGB versus CMYK, uh, consistent readability online? Uh, I guess I can answer the first part, uh, the RGB versus CMYK. When you're dealing with web, you always want to think RGB, you know, red, green, blue. Uh, when you're dealing with print, you think of CMYK, uh, and so that's based on four colors. Uh, but uh, so you want to make a distinction. If, are you really designing for web or are you designing for uh, print? Um, now, you know, you could do, uh, do is uh, create your infographic um, on uh, any platform, Illustrator and so on, and set it to CMYK if you got one of those uh, more complicated or uh, design savvy programs, and then uh, generate a RGB uh, from there. Now, as far as online based tools, what you can do is it, they're, by default, they are RGB based because they're meant to be online. And of course, if you download as a PDF, uh, which would be a more printer uh, friendly format, in that case, uh, some of them will convert to CMYK. Uh, but it's really, again, CMYK only comes in handy if you're going to send it to a professional printer. When you print on your own computer, uh, often uh, they don't translate that exactly to CMYK. Um, and I guess the next part, Randy, for you is what about the consistent readability online? I'm not sure if you want to add something to that. Um, you know, obviously RGB is what we would use for online. Um, we're, you know, we talked earlier about the tall format and knowing what the primary, you know, avenue of publication and distribution was going to be. And if it's online, we're totally focused in RGB. Um, and also going back into readability, which is really a question of color choice. Um, you know, part of it, we mentioned, you know, the color blindness tools that help us adapt our color palettes in a specific design. Um, but, you know, part of it is just choosing that color palette to begin with. I mean, a lot of colors are really hard to read on dark backgrounds, you know, or bright colored backgrounds. Um, and so part of that color choice, you know, we go through and try and find a palette that's nice and consistent. Um, but the other thing is we try to minimize the color palette as much as possible. You know, again, we want to use that pre-attentive attribute. We might do just a two-color design where it's red and gray or red and black. You know, and the and the text and the, the detailed information is in black, but all of our highlight and our key message would be in that red, and we would try to simplify those colors as much as possible. All right, great. Uh, let's see here. By the way, while I'm asking the last few questions, we only have about five, six more minutes. Uh, there is a little um, uh, poll in progress. You can vote because what we do is we listen to the feedback from users and formulate our next uh, infographic topics and the future ones. Uh, with that said, uh, there's a question from Elizabeth. I guess I was hoping for more examples of converting various kinds of information into infographic format. Um, I spent a lot of time on information in the beginning that was extraneous to this uh, presentation. Yeah, so there's a whole um, art to you know choosing and finding not only the right visualization, but like I said, there are usually uh, a number of different ways that you can visualize the same set of data. Um, I'll offer, there's a great website, it's still under construction, called the Data Visualization Catalog. Um, and they've got about two-thirds of it built where it's, you know, I think it's something like a hundred different ways to visualize data, and they talk about what data sets are appropriate for that visualization, and even have links to different tools that can help you build that type of visualization if you have the right kind of data to work with. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's really, a, when you get to the heavy data visualization side, there really are a whole bunch of ways to visualize data, and you have to have a toolbox of different websites and applications that can build those different kinds of visualizations. All right, great. So let's see, the next question uh, would be from um, Iger uh, asking, uh, are you, do you have any experience with using infographics in B2B offers? For example, explaining advantages of services or products. Yeah, we do a lot of that. I mean, obviously, the, the big, you know, the viral infographics are usually B2C, um, but we work with a lot of B2B clients that are talking about the value of their uh, product or service or their competitive advantage. In fact, we've even done um, what I call an elevator pitch infographic, where it's a snapshot of everything about a company or a company's product or service. And so in a couple, you know, again, the five second rule, somewhere between five and 10 seconds, you not only understand what the company does, um, like might be maintenance or it might be cleaning or it might be um, repair or delivery. Um, and you know, their geographic region, you know, their competitive advantage and, you know, you, in just a couple seconds in an infographic, you can really explain what your company is and what they do. All right, great. Uh, so let's see, just a couple more questions before we wrap up here. 
Um, next one will be, what if the user wants to print long infographics? How do you incorporate that into the design for both scenarios? Um, I guess, so this goes a little bit along the last question about uh, RGB versus CMYK. In this case, we're talking about sizes. Uh, do you want to chime in on that, Randy? Yeah, I'll, I'll, we've done it a couple different ways um, when we've had that come up. Um, probably the most popular way is that you'd have the big, tall infographic and as a JPEG file uh, on the landing page, but then the PDF link that's available for download, we would break that design up into page size chunks um, or might even turn them into, I've seen um, done into presentation slides. You know, so there might be a, a tall infographic, but if you break it up, it's six presentation slides, and that's how you build the PDF that's available for download. Okay, great. All right, let's take a couple more. Uh, next question is, is it possible to get slides from this presentation? So we're recording this presentation. Um, uh, this uh, webinar, it is gonna be as a video posted along with some notes on our blogs so in the coming days. It will be on the blog.vizme.co. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you'll be able to refer to it there. I'm not sure if Randy, if you're looking at, uh, you can answer the part about the uh, slides. Yeah, I will look at it. I have a handful of presentations that can be up on Vizme or up on SlideShare or somewhere. Um, I'll look through it again and see if we can get those posted. All right, great. Let's see, there's a question here on, uh, I guess this would appeal more towards us on a Vizme. Uh, Paymon, do you have an ETA for the major update to VizMe that you mentioned over the last few months? Uh, yes, uh, this is from Daniel. Um, yes, we do. Actually, we are heavily testing it now internally. Uh, it has been a multi-month uh, task. Uh, it's looking great, but we are definitely taking our time to make sure that this will set the foundation for a lot of great things to come on VizMe. So that will be coming on. Stay tuned. Um, all right, let's see. One last question, Randy. I'm going to pick. We've got a bunch of them here. Um, where is the best place or way to store infographics for ongoing access? Um, yeah, so like I said earlier, I think I would repeat to say that you want the original full-size infographic to be hosted ideally on your own company's website or somewhere that you're going to want to point everybody to um, with because then you're going to want to share it in blog posts and in social media and create those infographic snippets we talked about. Um, but you'd want it to be somewhere where you have control of the page and you can see analytics for that page. So that's really you want to find, like, what's that home going to be? Because when people share it, um, like we mentioned, they might be a thumbnail, they might be a smaller size on a blog or a snippet on social media, um, but there needs to be that one home for the full-size original infographic. All right, great. Um, and so that's pretty much, uh, it concludes our uh, webinar here. Well, maybe why don't we take one last question uh, just uh, for the sake of it, uh, Randy. I'm gonna pick, we got seven, eight more. Uh, let's see, Wayne Johnson is asking, what is the name of the uh, data visualization group pool under construction? Um, which, which can you refer to that, Randy? I think you talked oh, about- Oh yeah, I mentioned it. Was, it's called the Data Visualization Catalog. Data Visualization Catalog, all right. Well, thank you everybody for attending this webinar and uh, it's been great, Randy, having you here. A lot of great answers, a lot of good information. Again, this will be recorded and we'll post it on our blog in the coming days. And uh, based on the survey results that we got here, where the majority, almost 90% said they, they loved it and they would attend the next one or that it was great and they uh, may join the next one again. So uh, we will definitely like to invite Randy back for another one. So we will be in touch and announce the next uh, topic in the next coming weeks. Our uh, goal is to do this on a monthly basis. Uh, anything else you wanna add in, Randy? And uh, no. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, you know, stay tuned. And thank you, Payman. You're welcome. Take care now.